Welcome back to our small group series on the questions that Jesus asked. I hope your group has been getting to wrestle with the why behind these inquiries from Jesus. In this session, we're going to take a look at Jesus' question to his disciples in Matthew chapter 16. And while you're turning there in your Bibles or finding the scripture on your phones, let me share with you some likely obvious, not so shocking information about myself. I was not a great student. I was not and am not a great student. Even now, I'm the last person you want to sit beside in church or in a meeting or anywhere you're trying to learn something. Uh, to put it kinder than many of my elementary teachers would have, I'm a living, breathing distraction. At one point in school, three quarters of a refrigerator box was placed around my desk so I was not distracted, nor could I distract my classmates. I always had a hard time studying. It, it seemed to me that nothing would actually stick in my brain. Flashcards would help. Some games would make it a little more fun. Tutors tried to keep me on track, but I usually just ended up learning just enough to pass the class or pass the test or the quiz. But later in the day, the information was gone. For me, it was uh, cram all the information, unload the answers, and hope for the best. It, knowing the right answers at the right time is not always a bad thing. But in my case, now with a child of my own who's going through school, I really wish I had retained some of that information. You know, kept some of those math equations or English rules. I wish I had not been so distracted in school and actually understood the difference between knowing the right answers and actually learning the material. I think this is where I connect the most with Simon Peter in the Gospels. The first thing Jesus says to Simon when they meet is that, that he's going to be known as Peter or Petros, which means rock. And honestly, up to this point in Jesus' ministry, Simon has proven to be sharp, jagged, and quite hard-headed. Peter seems to be most known for putting his foot in his mouth or putting a soldier's ear on the ground or putting a whole lot of distance between him and Jesus the night of the crucifixion. But for all of the things Simon Peter, the rock-headed disciple, is infamous for, on this particular moment, maybe the most important moment, he had the right answer. In Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13, Jesus starts by asking his disciples a question. The first one is just a warm-up question, an icebreaker, if you will. Jesus said to the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus knew all of these things. He wasn't naive. He wasn't asking for intel from his disciples or anything like that. But he did want the disciples to take notice of all of the conflicting narratives that were swarming. You see, the crowds would disappear. As soon as Jesus started talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, when the parables got a little too personal, once people realized he wasn't there to get rid of the Roman Empire, Jesus knew in the end there would only be a handful of men and women, his disciples, his followers, who would know the gravity of having the answer to his next question. And it's Peter who nails it. He has the right answer. Look at verse 15. But you, he said, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. It's with bold confidence. The usually blockheaded Peter says the right thing. It's like he pulled an all-nighter and actually studied for the right class. And that's, that's a story for another time. Uh, Jesus goes on to admonish Peter the rock. He, it goes from a nickname, the rock, to a prophecy. Jesus tells him that that confession, on that confession, the church would be built. A statement that has unified the global church for thousands of years. That Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. It's a confession that every person who's baptized here at Northside will make. A core belief of the faith. It is the right answer at the right time, in the right place. Good game, high fives all around. Peter nailed it. And I wish that's why I related to Peter so much. The redemption story. You know, the kid who won't study but pulls off an ACT score that's crazy or high. But it's more what happens next of how I can relate to Peter. In the verses that follow, we see Peter with the keys to the kingdom, the right answer to unleash the birth of the church. He trips over his sandals again. Look at verse 21. From then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes to be killed and raised on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh, no, Lord, this will never happen to you. 
Jesus turned and told Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me because you're not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. Oh, what a turn of events. Peter got the right answer on the quiz, but he immediately failed the field test. I recently finished a book by A.J. Swoboda where he describes the difference between orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Stick with me here. Orthodoxy being right beliefs, like the doctrine that you have. Orthopraxy being the right living or the right practice of those beliefs. Both of these are necessary for following Jesus. I think we can often confuse the two and get heavy-handed one way or another. We have our beliefs and our doctrine down, but our lives look different. Or we, we look good, but our actual beliefs are wishy-washy. The question Jesus asked his disciple is an orthodoxy question, a question of belief. Who do you say that I am? He isn't, he isn't asking, who do you tell other people that I am? He actually tells them in verse 20 not to tell people that he's the Messiah. This is an orthodoxy question, a question of belief. And almost immediately, that inner belief and doctrine is put to the test. Jesus starts to talk about the threat on his life, and Peter just can't let it happen. His old self-defensive, impulsive behaviors start to kick in, and the belief that he stated that he had, that Jesus was the Son of God, can't make the leap from his mind to his actions. He wants to save Jesus from the very thing that he came to do. He wants to be the Savior of his Savior. Now, don't hear me wrong. Doctrine is important. But if right belief is not balanced with right living, James would say that we're just like the demons. They also have a correct doctrine when it comes to what they believe in God. But Jesus wants more than just the right answers. We walk a dangerous path if we cram in all the Sunday school answers yet still try to save ourselves. In your discussion time, I'd like you to share and wrestle with some of the beliefs that you have that are the hardest to live out. Why is it often hard to take a belief and turn it into action? And it's my prayer that we would be followers of Jesus in our orthodoxy and orthopraxy, not only in our deep held beliefs, but also in our real world lives.